What we're going to talk about today is theory, more specifically theories in aging. This lecture is only covering theoretical aspects of aging and methodology will be covered in a separate lecture. So what is theory? We've discussed in class that a theory is a way to make sense out of your complex reality. It's a way to make sense of the world around you. Theories may start with an idea. They can start with a belief or a hunch. You may have a theory about how to determine whether someone is going to say yes when you ask them out. You may have a theory about how your parents will react when you say you're changing your major to something else and have to be in school longer. You base these theories on previous ideas, beliefs, and circumstances. Well, scientists try to develop theories that produce testable hypotheses. These hypotheses then guide scientists in their work of research. So social scientists formulate studies then to test their hypotheses to see whether their hypotheses are confirmed, rejected, or they need to modify the theoretical aspect of the study. So in gerontology, there are many theories to address aging. Uh, some are biological theories, such as why skin wrinkles or why some people develop more health problems than others as they age. There are some theories that are based on psychological aging, such as mental issues, like dementia. How does dementia occur as one ages? Then there may be a sociological research, such as how social change impacts retirement. Think about what we're seeing being discussed on Social Security and the possibility of disbanding Social Security for future generations. How will this change impact poverty in older adults down the road? We know poverty in older adults has dropped because of Social Security. So if we remove Social Security as a safety net, then what impact will occur? There are two levels of theories, micro and macro. And just looking at the definition of micro and macro gives you a hint as to what they mean. So micro indicating small, or in the case of theory, an individual level. And macro indicates large, or in the case of theory, the larger system, such as large scale events or social institutions. In aging, these theories focused on at the micro level, the micro level, how individuals change as they age. We can look at how they change from a biological, psychological, or social perspective. For example, how does this individual change when they move from a house to a nursing facility? Or how does the individual change when they go from being part of a couple to a single person because of the death of a spouse or partner or later life divorce? And at the macro level, we're looking more at the bigger picture. For example, a change in the social structures and how older adults fit into that context and adapt to it. I addressed one of these aspects in a previous example about social security and how a change in that social system would change older adults as a whole, not at an individual basis. This is a wonderful sheet on theories, the levels, perspectives, and how they're aligned. Use this. I have put a copy of it into your uh, online learning management, which would either be NECA or Blackboard. So print it out. Uh, you may be able to use this as you move through other sociology or gerontology coursework. It also makes an excellent way, uh, it breaks it down into exactly where the theories that we are talking about fit within the levels and the perspectives and what theories are underneath. So let's cover the three theoretical perspectives in the next few minutes. First, we have the interpretive perspective, which is a micro level theory, meaning what? Well, it means that it focuses on the individual. It looks at how people relate to each other and how they create social order. It looks at how people define situations. Before we go any further, 
I want to note that relatively few gerontologists use this perspective to older you use this to study older adults. I may be one of the few. So the interactionist perspective sees people as an actor and a creator of social life. So the people create the groups and they work to maintain them. So uh, think about how we create social life and order. So who enters the door first? Do you remember the old adage, age before beauty? Older adults are to enter the door before younger people. Women usually are to enter before men. Who determines these social rules or norms? Well, we do, as people. All of these actions are learned from childhood. So there are critiques of the interpretive perspective. First, it only gives one view of social life. It overlooks the link between the individual and the social institution. So, for example, if you're sick and you need medical care, but you do not have insurance, what impact does the doctor's office bureaucracy or the hospital bureaucracy have on your life? Can you get care? Do you have to pay? How do you pay? Can you pay something? How do you determine how much to pay? How can you pay? The interactionist perspective also does not look at the impact of social policies on groups or on people. So we go back to the problem of social security. Interactionists would not study or examine how changes in the policies affect the individual. And the interactive perspective does not discuss power and conflict between social groups. So there is no study on how race or gender intersect with health care or social So the functionalist perspective views society as being cooperative and harmonious. They believe that consensus holds society together. It's the same beliefs, values, and norms that make society have consensus and maintain social order. Functionalism interprets social groups as a system made up of many parts whose parts are interdependent upon each other. So to, if there is a change in one group, it automatically leads to change in every group that is associated with that change group. In other words, the whole goal is to maintain or reestablish order. So society regulates itself this way. It tries to stay in equilibrium. The basic concern is for order, social order, and that individuals need to be controlled. The individual is only important to the extent that they are part of society and provide a function for society as a whole. So if you've ever seen the movie Hot Fuzz and the Neighborhood Watch Alliance is always mentioning the greater good. In other words, the individual is only important as long as they are controlled as long as they abide by the rules and norms and conform to the group's desires. So I also have to mention what is considered the opposite of function, which is usually dysfunction. So when society breaks down, there is then dysfunction. So maintaining a status quo is imperative in a functional society. So if there is dissensus or dysfunction rather than consensus in societal problems may occur. But it's up to society to right the dissensus or dysfunction and the disruption so society then can return to functioning effectively. The functionalist perspective is used by gerontologists more than any other perspective. In fact, several theories relative uh, to gerontology are disengagement theory, activity theory, modernization theory, and age stratification theory. So age stratification theory links individual aging to social change. The theory discusses the interplay between individual aging and social change. When we talk about stratification, we're discussing the division of people into layers maybe even a hierarchy. We can then separate people into groups by their age. 
we can also separate them into groups such as children, teenagers, young adults, older adults, all of which are distinct groups. So age qualifies and disqualifies people for certain privileges, social roles, and prestige. And age stratification affects roles, self-concepts, and life satisfaction. Age stratification also looks at aging as a lifelong process. You experience biological changes as you age. So you also experience social role and social position changes as you age. There are social roles people enter and leave throughout their life, particularly as they age. So the social roles can include, say, the role of a child the role of a student, the role of a spouse, the role of a parent, a worker, a retiree, maybe even a grandparent. These roles are often based on chronological age, which of course is the number of years you've been alive. So we would expect a student to be a particular age. All right, look at an elementary student. So would an elementary student be 20? No, but we would expect an elementary student or a fourth grader to be between nine and 10 we would expect a college student to be 18, early 20s, but not 12. There again, we would not expect a grandparent to be 20 years old. Grandparents might be over 30 or 40, depending on when they had children and when their children had children. Social roles also have certain expectations that go along with them. For example, a college professor is expected to give lectures, grade exams, and have a particular education level. Students are expected to come to class, take notes, and study. We don't expect the student to teach the class. That's not their role. We also have to discuss what is cohort flow. So a cohort flow is where age cohorts move through the age graded system and transitions together. So think of it within your high school graduating class. Many times, if you stayed in place long enough to finish the school in the same city where you started, you may have started first grade or kindergarten with some of the same people you graduated from high school with. You are all the same age, and you move through the age graded system, your school years, together. You've shared unique experiences that other age cohorts do not have. So if you all had Miss Fannie Mae Falk for a principal in second grade through sixth grade, you have a shared unique experience that children in other schools with different principals did not have. So moving through these age graded experiences is like moving an, by an escalator. So as one group leaves an age grade, they move from elementary to middle school, say, the next group enters elementary school. And the group moving from middle school to high school is replaced by the group who just left elementary school. At the same time all these transitions are occurring, each cohort of children brings into an age grade a new set of norms and values that lead to social life changes. So this illustration by Kurtzer always helped me understand what is meant by cohort flow. Additionally, look at the bottom of the chart. Time is added. So not only is each cohort's experience of moving through these transitions and through social roles differently, but they are also changed by time, historical times and historical change. And not only is each cohort changed by historical times, but they're changed based upon which age graded strata they are in because they experience it all at different ages. So for example, various members of my family experienced World War II differently than others. So my mother, who was quite young, experienced it from the standpoint of going to school and seeing newsreels at movie theaters. My uncle experienced it from the standpoint of being at Pearl Harbor and then being in the South Pacific. Still, another uncle experienced it from the European War Theater. All three lived during World War II, but experienced it from different vantage points. And then, of course, if you look at my grandmother, she experienced it from a whole different standpoint. She had to deal with the rationing of the sugar and the butter and fuel and coffee and stockings. So all of these add up to what are the differences between each of the age and the cohort and the cohort flow. So age stratification theory relies on many assumptions of the structural functionalist toward aging. 
Uh, first, it assumes that norms and values influence individual aging. And second, it describes the relationship between the individual and society as a feedback loop. The feedback loop is rather complicated, but just know that change can begin either with the individual cohort or societal change. Sometimes it may be the chicken and the egg dilemma, which came first. Then these changes lead to change in other parts of the social system. And third, the age stratification theory tends to see society as a homogenous set of structures and functions that all people experience in the same way. So one of the strengths of age stratification theory is that it's helped to separate age differences or between cohorts from age-related changes or the process of aging over the life course. And additionally, age stratification theory highlights the impact of both historical and social changes on individuals and cohorts. Third, it highlights the relationship between aging and social structures. So age stratification theory provides new ways to explore difference related to time, period, and cohort. So there are several limitations of the age stratification theory. Since it states that society is homogenous, there is very little focus on gender, class, or race within cohorts. That means that many people are completely left out of the picture. So this is similar to stating that all baby boomers are rich and materialistic. We've ignored the various demographic differences that the population has. It completely misses the diversity within the cohorts and diversity of experience. This leads to a lot of bias. So by ignoring a race clash class or gender, we have completely ignored their choices given to them throughout life, their reaction to socio-historical events. So age stratification theory also overlooks an individual's interpretation of the social world. There is little reference to individual control or action. It totally ignores how our individualism makes sense of history and society. For example, using the example of war. So going to war may make someone a more patriotic individual and may make them extend their military stay for a career. It also may make someone hate war, refuse to ever put a uniform on again, and turn them into a pacifist. The theory does not account for these differences. Lastly, Functionalist theories have a conservative bias. Since functionalism sees equilibrium and social order as the preferred social condition, it fails to account for conflict and tension between groups or issues of power. So race, gender, and class create unequal access to particular items or situations needed for success in life. The conflicts, power issues, and inequality constructs shape people's lives and their aging process. Unequal access to health care may say more about poor health than the age cohort someone is born into. Another functionalist approach may actually bridge the micro and macro levels of analysis and can overcome some of the limitations of age stratification theory. So life course perspective acknowledges the difference within age cohorts, social roles, and role changes. It incorporates social interaction and social structure within its framework. Life course perspective may also merge several theoretical perspectives from various disciplines. However, regardless, life course recognizes variety in life course patterns and circumstances. It recognizes the differences within and between members of the same age cohort, such as race, gender, social class, and ethnicity. It recognizes life as a dynamic process that is interactive, multidirectional, and is lifelong. It allows for stability, decline, and improvement over the course of one's life. So the life course perspective also looks at transitions and trajectories. 
So when we're talking about transitions, that refers to changes in social status or roles. So transitions may include marriage, divorce, remarriage, widowhood, and parenthood. Also, retirement, work, and job changes. Trajectories refer to a long-term pattern of stability and change and may include many transitions. So in talking, say, about a marital trajectory, that may involve the transition from being single to being married, being married to being divorced, being divorced to remarriage, and perhaps remarriage to widowhood. Another trajectory may only include single to married and marriage to widowhood. Life course perspective is not necessarily seen as a single theory, but a perspective. It's an amalgamation of multiple theories. So conflict theory is heavily influenced by the works of Marx, but it also reflects the works, works of Weber, Dahrendorf, uh, Bourdieu, uh, Mills, and Collins. So conflict theory has been very popular in the U.S. since the 1960s. It focuses on the problem of social order and believes that society is bound together as the bounding is done through power and coercion. So conflict theorists view society as competitive, unequal, and conflictual. A very simplistic view of the basic idea of conflict theory is that the nature of groups will bring conflict over limited amounts of resources, whether the resources are economic power or status. Social order is maintained because the individuals are forced to do as they're told. From a conflict perspective, those groups with power determine the rules and the structure of constraint within society. Marx saw conflict as a struggle between social classes. Few gerontologists use the social, uh, use the conflict perspective in their work. Those who do often look at how economics or policies influence old age. So political economy is not much a theory as it is a framework for looking at larger social context of problems that are associated with age. Uh, political economy highlights the structural influences on aging and emphasizes the relevance of social structures which are embedded in power relationships for understanding how old is defined and how older adults are treated. It states that the political and economic structures of a capitalist society is the root of the older adults' problems. It looks at how social programs and policies for older adults serve the interest of the middle-aged, middle-class professionals and can reinforce differences in gender, race, and social class and aging. It also acknowledges that old age is a social construction which mirrors the unequal distribution of resources in youth and middle age. It understands the nature of old age as it is socially constructed and how it is created through power struggles. So political economy theory says that age-based welfare programs stigmatize older adults and that these services lower the status of the older adult by treating them as social problems that need to be fixed. So by stigmatizing older people, the welfare system decides what the old people need. Now, of course, this happens not by asking the old people, but by asking the middle class workers to decide what is needed. This then leads to more social service bureaucracy, where the control then lies not in the hands of the older adult, but in the hand of the service worker, with little regard to what the older person needs or wants. Therefore, the older adult has little control over the services. So several strengths lie within the political economy theory. First, it allows aging to be studied in the context of the larger political, historical, economic, and social forces. Second, it views public pensions and income in later life as the outcome of a struggle between competing groups. Third, it predicts that economic and political forces will shape future changes in public pensions. The political economy approach may emphasize the impact of history and economics on individuals, but it tends to overemphasize the problems and poverty that older adults face. 
It doesn't look at how individuals shape their world through their interactions with others. It tends to look only at how politics and economy forces its way onto the life of the older adult. It also paints old, old people, all old people, as powerless and, and unable to have any control over their own lives. So one of the discoveries of the political economy theory research is that social programs that may actually appear to benefit people end up benefiting business interests more. One reason is the business interests often exert enormous influence in shaping the policy's agenda. So political uh, economy has been criticized for being too negative about aging and looking at older adults only as passive individuals and not taking into account individual agency. So before moving into feminist theory, let me state that feminist theoretical approaches to aging uh, do not mean that we're ignoring older men. Rather, feminist theory acknowledges that older men pay a huge price for having to live up to societal ideals about masculinity. Men, because of society's masculinity ideals, tend to overdrink, drive recklessly, and engage in risky behaviors. So as a result, men experience higher death rates than women at every stage in the life course. So feminist theories bridge the micro and macro levels of analysis. Society is gendered by nature, and so gender defines social interactions and experiences throughout life, including the process of aging. So when considering patriarchal systems, such as the U.S. and others, where the society is male-dominated, there are inequalities based on gender. These inequalities are created and are perpetuated, leading to social advantage for men. For example, if men earn more than women, they have higher wages, then these higher wages will lead to higher retirement income in later life. So the disparity in earnings leads to less retirement income for older women and a higher rate of poverty in old age. So feminist theorists criticize other aging theories for not focusing enough on gender inequalities. Feminist theories have several strengths, and they do make important contributions to the study of aging. So first, feminist theories realize the importance of social structure, social interaction, and individual characteristics on aging. And of course, these individual characteristics are your race, social class, and ethnicity. Um, it's similar to life course perspective. Second, feminist theorists are more inclusive rather than exclusive. So they bring a focus to those who are more likely to age, which of course is women. Women are the majority of the older population, so these issues in aging affect women more than they affect men. Feminist theories also challenge the traditional focus on men in research, in particular white middle class men. But there are limitations to feminist theoretical perspectives. One major critique is that gender is too narrow a focus for aging study and that it overlooks the issues and experiences of older men, particularly those men who are not white and middle class. Because of this critique, some feminist theories have begun to look at aging experience of marginalized men, those who do not fit into the white middle class box. Additionally, Feminist theorists have been criticized for focusing only on problems women experience during aging and not focusing on their positive experience and contributions to society. So when looking at the limits of the conflict perspective, there are several limits. Um, first, conflict theory overemphasizes poverty. Um, there's too much focus on the economic aspects of conflict. Secondly, in regards to aging, there is an overemphasis on problems. Remember, too, this is very similar to the historical aspects of studying aging. We only are focusing on the problems. And also, conflict theory pays little attention to the responses older people make to societal pressures. The conflict perspective has three major critiques. 
While conflict focuses on force, coercion, and power, it ignores the way that people reach agreements. So conflict perspective only sides with the people who are less powerful. It totally ignores the powerful. And it also focuses on economic factors or money as the sole issue for all conflict in society. Since conflict theory states that power is a person's main objective, it looks at the whole of social life as a zero-sum game. So one person's gain is comprised of another person's equal loss, and that simply is not the case. We also must realize that conflict theory tends to treat ideas as only being a reflection of the interest of the powerful, but often the narrow interests of the powerful does not fully explain all of the events. Additionally, while conflict theory explains how a group maintains power, it does not show how the group got power in the first place. Probably the largest takeaway message from this lecture is that theories offer many explanations of aging, but theory is not a marginal, meaningless, tacked-on exercise to presenting results in an empir empirical paper. Rather, cumulative theory building represents the core of the foundation of scientific inquiry and knowledge.